be back here and there we go the recording is 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 on so just keeping that in mind anything you say i don't know is going to be held on zoom forever and ever um there's the recording i guess i'll i'll start by by saying the recording really is for anyone who misses the class and would like to catch up later so um for those of you who are new um you'll be getting a, a an email every wednesday morning and in that email, you'll have a reminder of this Zoom link, which will stay the same every week. And it will also have a click here for the recording if you missed last week. So you don't have to ask me, will you be sending out the recording? The answer is yes, we'll be sending out the recording, but you'll have to wait till the next Wednesday morning to get the recording. It's better than sending out multiple emails every week. So that's gonna be on your weekly Wednesday morning email. Um, and just welcome, welcome back. Uh, we are continuing the adventure that we started uh, last year, taking Broadway musicals and Torah texts and putting them in conversation with each other in sometimes very unexpected and, and interesting ways. My goal as, as before is to enrich our understanding of both the text and the musical. Um, through our exploration of both. And I have found this to be such, um, such an unexpected and delightful uh, experience. Um, and, and sometimes when you kind of enter Jewish text study through the side door, you find things that you, you didn't see before because you're not looking at it in the same way as you usually do. So we're not sitting down and opening the Torah and opening, you know, this week's parasha is, and here's what's happening to, you know, Yaakov and his sons or whatever it is. We're, we're starting with a different narrative or maybe a, a metaphor or a theme and then finding that embedded in the text in a different way. So um, rather than hop around from musical to musical as we did for most of last year, um, I, I liked sort of settling into a musical, which ended up happening toward the tail end of last year where we settled into Hamilton for a number of weeks in a row. And so that is what we're going to do with this uh, semester, if you can call it. This is the semester of Oz. We're off to Oz and we're going to be looking at songs from the Wizard of Oz, a little bit The Wiz and also from Wicked. Um, and I guess just, by way of introduction, I'll also say that The Wizard of Oz and The Wiz were both musicals that told a similar narrative. The Wiz, um, if you're not familiar, we'll, we'll get into it in future weeks, but it was sort of a modern day take um, in a, a black musical um, starring Diana Ross. And, uh, and yet it was still Dorothy sort of getting to see The Wizard as opposed to Wicked, which is really a different narrative. It's a different story. It's the story behind the witches, the, the understanding of how the Wicked Witch became wicked. So um, I'm, I'm cl clustering our classes in, in that way that um, for the first number of weeks, we're going to spend time in the Wizard of Oz or the Wiz, and then we'll move on to Wicked. Um, some of the themes may overlap, but really they're different stories. So I found that I was getting stuck in my planning. I was getting stuck with kind of these two musicals and that one living in separate worlds. So that's where we're gonna be. We're gonna be in two different worlds separately. Uh, but, but we're gonna start off with the yellow brick road, which you can see sort of in the distance behind me. And for those who are new to our class, um, I'm going to keep the, the format that I think worked rather well last year, which is that we'll start with the music, we'll look at the text, um, everyone will be staying on mute, but the chat is open and available to you. And then for the last, you know, 10 minutes or so of our time together, uh, last 10 minutes of the hour, I'll open it up for a group conversation so that everyone can, can give their input verbally. Um, as always, I love when your cameras are on if you're able to, but if it's easier for you to keep your camera off and, you know, walk around doing your dishes or whatever it is while you're listening, we've all been there and no judgments. And if sometimes your camera's on and sometimes it's off, we'll just be happy to see you when we do. And um, the last thing I wanted to say by way of introduction is um, that I've been thinking a lot about trying to come back in person because many of us are ready and, and the synagogue is open every day and we have Minyan every day and we have Shabbat services every Shabbat. And 
Um, we want to keep getting the message out there that we're open, the shah is happening, and people are coming in the building, and we have bar and bat mitzvahs and weddings and all kinds of things as usual. Um, and at the same time, recognize that for many people, Zoom is still more comfortable. Well, and certainly for a class like this, which requires, you know, listening together, watching videos together, um, Zoom is very conducive. Um, and of course, without Zoom, how would we see you, Max, in Chicago? <laughs> so, so I'm not getting rid of the Zoom at all, but I'm playing with the possibility of having a hybrid class. And I'm not doing that yet because the mechanisms have not yet been set up fully in the synagogue to do that, but we're working toward that. So for anyone who had spoken to me, a couple of people had spoken to me saying, can we come in person yet? When is the class gonna be back in person? The answer is, I hope we'll get to that point, but I'll never get rid of the Zoom because the Zoomers, we, we need you as well. So um, for now we're Zooming and uh, we're glad to be able to do that. And I'll keep you posted about future, um, uh, future plans. Um, remember that every class really stands on its own. So if you miss a week, don't fret, come back next week. We always want to see you. Um, I think that was, oh, I almost forgot. Um, there is a podcast version of this coming out very, very soon. I, I think I spoke about it before the summer saying it's going to be here in a few weeks. And then I, I didn't understand all of the technical requirements of putting together, you know, music and visuals and it's taken a lot longer, like everything. It's taken a lot longer than we thought, but I actually think in the next week or two, um, I'll have a podcast to share with you. And that podcast is now called Verses because we look at verses from Broadway and verses from Torah. Um, and my co-host is Anita Silver, who has been in our Zoom room uh, last year and just happens to not be here with us today. Um, and we'll be coming out with a season, which is eight episodes, and then we'll see what happens after that. So I'll keep you posted. We're building a Facebook group around that. I don't know. We'll see where it, we'll see where it goes, where Broadway and Torah meets. That's our tagline versus where Broadway and Torah meets. So really where Broadway and Torah met first was right here in this Zoom. You were all here to see it. Um, and, uh, and we'll continue that conversation in other, in other avenues, which I'm very excited about. All right. So the yellow brick road. Um, the yellow brick road is our guide, is our, is our protection, is our assurance that we know where we're going. And we're going to look at the yellow brick road and compare it to the, that which guided B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, in their long journey to the promised land. It wasn't Oz, but it was the land of Israel, of course. And what guided them was that cloud, the cloud and the, and the fire. Uh, we'll look at those verses. Uh, but first, we will listen to the original Yellow Brick Road from the film, The Wizard of Oz film, where Dorothy first um, is told of the Yellow Brick Road. And uh, as we're watching it, I'll just encourage you all to think about these themes of, of guidance, of protection, um, ways in which the character of Glinda here sort of evokes a uh, I don't know, an angelic presence even, and ways in which the yellow brick road is, is going to be Dorothy's guide through threat and, and tribulation. So here we are. We'll watch this clip and then we'll look at the text. But it's not a sulfur. I'm afraid you've made rather a bad enemy of the wicked witch of the West. The sooner you get out of Oz altogether, the safer you sleep, my dear. Oh, I'd give anything to get out of Oz altogether. But which is the way back to Kansas? I can't go the way I came. No, that's true. The only person who might know would be the great and wonderful Wizard of Oz himself. The Wizard of Oz? Is he good or is he wicked? Oh, very good, but very mysterious. He lives in the Emerald City, and that's a long journey from here. Did you bring your broomstick with you? No, I'm afraid I didn't. Well, then you'll have to walk. The Munchkins will see you safely to the border of Munchkin Land. And remember, never let those ruby slippers off your feet for a moment, or you will be at the mercy of the Wicked Witch of the West. But how do I start for Emerald City? It's always best to start at the beginning, and all you do is follow the yellow brick road. If 
eyes just follow the yellow brick road. come and go so quickly here. Follow the yellow brick road. 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 Follow, follow, follow. And there you have it. <laughs> it just, um, of course, this was 1939. It was the first film in Technicolor. Let's remember the brilliance of those colors and the excitement of this film. And just the charm of this story um, is so apparent when you watch that scene. Uh, we could have watched so many scenes, of course, from, from the musical, because this is the refrain. Every time she meets a new friend and they're off to see the wizard, they're follow the yellow brick road, follow the yellow brick road. So remember that this is a constant, almost a mantra, a reassurance. I'm not sure where we're going, what we're going to find when we get there, uh, what's going to meet us along the way. But as long as we follow the yellow brick road through the forest, uh, through the hills, you know, we'll get where we're going. Um, I don't want to stretch the metaphor too far. I don't think the Wizard of Oz is God. I don't think that, um, I'm, I'm not sure if Emerald City is the promised land or it's really Kansas because she's trying to go back home. Uh, but I, I want to focus on this feeling of faith and assurance and guidance, which the yellow brick road represents throughout this story. Um, and, and also because some people joined us, I'll just remind us that we're all gonna stay on Zoom for now and uh, feel free to use the chat if you feel comfortable to do so. And toward the end of our hour, we'll, we'll have a group conversation. So the yellow brick road is the path through uncertainty. And, and by the way, we're not going to stick with one metaphor, even though this is one musical, you know, next week we'll be looking at a different part and we're not always, we're not always in Egypt going to Israel. So I'm, I'm not going to keep myself to one operating metaphor, you know, throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the musical. Um, but I want to now share with you the text. And as I often say, really the text is my goal. The Broadway musical is just a new way in. So this is where we're gonna spend the crux of our time, the bulk of our time. Follow the cloud by day and the moon by night. Oh my gosh, the moon, I wrote the moon instead of the fire. <gasps> You know what I was doing? I had the, um, there's a chapter of Tehillim that we say, the sun will, the sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. Oh my gosh, it's the fire by night. So I found a typo in my own, in my own source sheet. Follow the cloud by day and the fire. <laughs> I'm such a, I'm such a stickler that I had to correct that right now. Okay, Ooh, wait, bear with me a second. I'll tell me if you can see it. So they get out of Egypt. Anyone having a trouble? You can see it, right? Can you give me a thumbs up if you see it? I just want to be able to, okay, thank you. So they get out of Egypt and they're heading toward the promised land. They don't yet know that it's going to take 40 years um, because all of the sins and the missteps haven't happened yet. But the the cloud is their GPS, if you will. And this is a quote from the book of Shemot um, in Parshat Beshalach. So they've literally just 
just come out of Egypt. They haven't even crossed the sea yet. And uh, as always, I'll read in the Hebrew and the English sort of jumping back and forth, or often I'll read in the Hebrew and loosely translate in the English so people can see the English that's here, but hear my translation, which may not be identical. The Hashem holich lifnehem, and God walks before them or what goes before them, Yomam, during the daytime, the Amudanan, um, in a pillar of cloud. Lan chotam haderech, to show them the way. And at night in a pillar of fire to provide light. So that they might travel both day and night. So we hear from, from here, some of the commentaries say, you see, they, they weren't only traveling in the day, sometimes they had to travel at, at night. And then there's this emphasis on the constancy. It is always there. The pillar of cloud will never leave or the pillar of fire by night from before the people. It's always there. And um, this Midrash, uh, which unfortunately Safari only had in Hebrew, I'll just loosely translate it, um, elucidates a little bit more about the, the fire which lit the way for them. The Amud Eish Lahir Lahem, so that the, the fire would be um, giving them light and the midrash says giving them light but it didn't give light to the entire night so there's an understanding that the fire is so miraculous that it gave them light but didn't allow other people to see or didn't didn't light up the whole night so this is something that's very personal guide it, it's different from a road that's sitting there regardless who who, you know, who is walking on that yellow brick road. Uh, but it's a personal representation of, of God's guidance, of God's presence within the people. So that's the first thing to note about maybe in contrasting the, the cloud fire and the, um, and the road was that this was something that wasn't there before, wouldn't be there after, and no one else could see. And I'm reminded of even echoes of the, the plague of darkness which was understood to be something that affected um, only the Egyptians couldn't see, but the Israelites could see. So light being something that's um, subjective and personal, almost emblematic of a relationship with God is very much present here in the, in the fire by night and, and the cloud by day as well. I wanna think a little bit more about the cloud. I know when I scroll, it gets, um, a little bit blurry for a second and then it settles in, right? So the cloud um, had many different dimensions. This is um, a midrash that says the cloud wasn't just a pillar at the front, that there were seven clouds. And I know we have some Hebrew readers. So I'll, again, I'll stay with the Hebrew when we can and then I'll, I'll have the Hebrew, English here for anyone who needs. Shiva ananim, seven clouds. Arba, four clouds from four directions and also one above them one below and then a seventh one so four sides and another two is six and the seventh another that was going in front of them so it almost sounds like the cloud the pillar of cloud that's mentioned explicitly in the torah is the one that's up ahead of them showing them where to go, the GPS, as I said, but there were more clouds than that. I don't know if they were um, understood to be an offshoot of the main cloud or what, but the, the other clouds had other goal, had other um, um, functions. And this cloud at, at the front also smoothed the path. Kol hanamuch magbiho, anything that was too low was lifted. Vichol hagavoa mashpilo, and anything that was too high was lowered. And then there's a proof text from Isaiah, which doesn't, the proof text doesn't necessarily have to be talking about this, but it's an expression in text that speaks to mountains and hills. And so the rabbis utilize it, shene emar, as it is written. And this is a quote from Isaiah, let every valley be raised, let every mountain and hill be lower, let the rugged ground become level, the ridges become plain. Um, so I'm, I'm skipping through that until the end of the quote here in the Hebrew. Um, but in essence, 
it's God paving the road. It's God paving the way. Um, very much like you know, then then you're encouraged to to, to stay on the, the the road, the yellow brick road. And I think a lot about the moments where Dorothy gets into trouble is where she veers off the road because it's dangerous. You know, she veers to the side of the forest. She finds the two men, or she veers to the poppies. Um, you know, as long as she stays on the yellow brick road and she has that in her head, follow the yellow brick road, follow the yellow brick road. This is something that symbolizes safety. Um, so similarly, the Israelites in the desert are in a treacherous place. And this cloud, this uh, guide is also something that's smoothing the way. And not only that, it protected them from wild animals. It would slay any snakes, and scorpions, um, and sweep and sprinkle. So like really cleaning the, the, the way, clearing, clearing a path, um, almost like the way we would, um, oh, what's the word when you're clearing a trail, right? Your trail, you're blazing a trail for them. Well, I'm seeing some of the chats in the, in the, uh, in the chat, like they were in the middle of a thought, right? So, Rabbi, ah, so Rabbi Yehuda, there are different opinions now. Um, Rabbi Yehuda says there were three, th I'm sorry, I'm just realizing that the, the translation is not exactly, it, it skips something here in the, in the English. The English goes right to Rabbi Yoshia said that there were four clouds. And Rebbe says there were two, just one in front of them and one over the Mishkan. Um, the Hebrew is a bit different, which I'm surprised by, but um, Safaria actually operates what's called open source, like people are freely translating. So I guess it's not always consistent. Um, the Hebrew has more opinions here. 13 clouds, two in every direction and so on. Four clouds, two clouds. Okay, I'm just hearing some Rachel, background. Yes. There are, there are two black boxes. One of them is sort of covering a bit of the Hebrew. And okay. one second, one. is that? Can you get rid of the that one better? on the right? Yeah, yes, you got rid of the one that covered the Hebrew, but can you get okay. rid of the one on the right? Oh, you know what it is? It might be my Zoom. Um, Evelyn, did that, did that make a difference? I don't know. Uh, or it would be you know, good if they were gone entirely, but if they're gonna be there, it was better on the, that's fine. Okay, okay, I think I've done it. Thank you. Okay, thanks for letting me know. Um, I want to just note the, um, the last opinion here, Rebbe says, Rebbe Omer Schneim, there were two clouds. That's the closest to the pshat, what we would call the simple meaning of the text because the text mentions the pillar of cloud, as we saw um, in our first text. And so there's one before them. And the text also mentions later on that there's a cloud over the Mishkan and when the cloud would rise, that's how they know to travel. And when the cloud rested, that's how they know to stop. And so um, you know, this, this, this Midrash sort of goes through something a little, little bit more fantastical, seven clouds, and yet uh, lands with a few other opinions, one of which is, I would say, the minimal, the minimalist opinion. There were two clouds. But either way, the cloud is guidance and the cloud is protection. And, and the people, of course, will need it because they're off in the wilderness, you know, in the unknown. Um, it's, it's important to note that, uh, of course, when we, when we celebrate the festival of Sukkot, we talk about these clouds, the Anane HaKavod because the, the sukkah represents God's protection of, of us in the wilderness. And oh wait, I'm trying to remember if I brought this here. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, and the, the sukkah is understood to be uh, symbol, uh, emblematic of the Ananeha Kavod, that which surrounded us, whether it was a literal sukkah that they were sleeping in huts throughout their journey, or whether it was symbolic of these clouds. Again. Um, the sukkah represents God's protection during this long journey. And uh, at least one understanding of, of the way, the reason we build sukkah, su sukkot is uh, because of these clouds on all sides. 
This next text I love because it it really shows us um, a little more richly like what what would it have been like to have these this cloud and then this fire alternating um, between between light and dark. So the pillar of cloud by day and the, and the pillar of fire by night departed not. And in Hebrew here, it's lo yamish amur ha'anan yomam ve'amur ha'ish layla. That's the verse we saw at the beginning, the second of the two verses we read. Um, the Gemara here, the, the Talmud reads an interpretation of the lo yamish. It did not depart. They were never without a guide. And what that meant was there was overlap. Melamed teaches us she'amur anan mashlim the amur ha'esh. Mashlim comes from the word lahashlim to complete, related to the word shalom, completion, so or wholeness. So, um, mashlim in in this text is translated as overlap. Um, that the cloud would overlap with the fire, and the amur ha'esh mashlim le amur ha'anan, and the fire would overlap with the cloud. So it means that the fire would appear just before it really became night and the cloud would appear just before the sun rose. They, they never were left with a gap. They never, there was not a gap in the road, so to speak, if we're back to the yellow brick road. Um, it was continuous. And um, this text actually, I, I, to be honest, I took it out of context. In the context, uh, this, this text was in the context of a conversation about when we start Shabbat, when we light Shabbat candles. And the idea that we light Shabbat candles early before the sun sets is connected to this idea that the pillar of fire had to come early so that it wouldn't be that we hit nightfall and the fire wasn't there. Uh, that overlap that we, and we do it on the other end of Shabbat as well, by the way, at Havdalah, we, um, we wait a little longer. We have Shabbat overlap with the week a little bit. This idea that, um, there is a time when we're hovering between day and night, ben hashmashot, uh, literally between the suns, right? Between the days. It's, it's a, um, an idea that comes up in many areas of Jewish law. And this, I just love because it's not a halachic conversation, really, when you talk about the cloud and the fire. It's a conversation around making sure they feel God's protection at all times. Um, but it comes up in the context of that ben hashmashot, that overlap time is it day is it night we want to make sure the security of the fire is present before they really feel the need at night before they feel that uncertainty of of darkness so that's why i wanted to bring i think it um it brings their experience to life a little bit i'm just going to pause and see if anyone has anything that they've written in the chat oh yes the bedtime prayer yes thank you elaine um, this, uh, this idea that there are angels around us, Michael at my right, Gabrielle at my left, Uriel before me, Raphael behind me and God above me. So God's protection on all, on all sides. Um, and the significance of having them travel by night, Evelyn, I, I mean, I don't know that there was a significance. I'd have to look back at the texts where I saw that discussed, um, I, I don't I don't have a good answer in terms of the significance of their journey necessarily, but um, it was a way of addressing the the idea that um, so I'm going to go back to the beginning here that uh, it says in the text I'm going to take this box away so we see it well it says in this text um, that they were traveling at all times and so. I think the idea is that they weren't limited to only daytime travel. Um, and that explains why they needed the fire just as much as they needed the cloud. They needed guidance at all times. So uh, uh, the one thing I, I also wanted to say about the cloud, oh, this is a different, okay. I'll say this in a second. The other thing that I wanted to say about the cloud is that the cloud continuously represents God's presence um, throughout their journey in the wilderness. And what I mean by that is um, later they arrive at Sinai and um, 
and there's thunder and lightning and then and then cloud and and when moses ascends the mountain moses goes into the cloud or behind the cloud um and similarly later in the book of in a couple of different places in the book of amibar it happens a few times and um, god appears in a cloud god comes to moses and aaron and speaks in a cloud so the cloud um and and as i mentioned before the cloud is resting over the mishkan over the tabernacle, which represents God's presence is there. Um, even when they finish building the Mishkan, the reason we kind of know that it's successful is that the, the cloud of God's glory, the cloud of God's presence fills the Mishkan, fills the tabernacle, um, symbolizing that God sort of enters the house, so to speak, that they've built for God. And, and it says Moses you know, can't see because of the thickness of the cloud. So um, the cloud is a motif for God's presence, perhaps for also the mystery of God's presence. And then that cloud is what's guiding them through their journey. I'm looking at the, I don't think the shaking of the lulav is related to the cloud, but it, oh, you mean the shaking of the lulav in all the directions. That's a great, yeah, that's a great point. I think that is a theme throughout Sukkot that we're meant to feel surrounded, surrounded by God, uh, protected by God. And uh, yes, the Lulav would be consistent with that. Um, how can the cloud be below them, David? <laughs> um, this is all miraculous. I don't know if they're walking on clouds or if they're, there's, there's elsewhere in, um, in the book of Devarim, it says that uh, their, their shoes did not wear out, nor their clothing, um, all the 40 years in the wilderness. So maybe this is why, because they were walking on, on clouds or on paved yellow brick road. So that's the best I can do with that. We can, we can talk more. Um, and yes, the cloud I think hides, hides God and hides, and hides Moses' face and Moses, Moses' presence with God. I wanted to show you uh, one more text. So this is from the book of Nehemiah, and um, it's a moment of revel uh, revelation is not the right word, a moment of teshuva, actually. The people have been wayward, they've forgotten the Torah, there's a public gathering and reading the Torah and almost like a summarizing of our nation's journey. And um, this actually is part of our sidur, our weekday davening, Atahu Hashem HaElokim, we say this um, in part of the Psuke de Zimra, the, the many verses that are read um, as that warm up before we get to the Shema and the Amidah. And so this excerpt um, falls right into place before we say Az Yashir, before we say the Song of the Sea as part of our daily Shachrit prayers. And so it's a direct quote um, from this section of Nehemiah. And it works there because it, it talks specifically about taking us out of Egypt, performing signs and wonders. And then in verse 11, you see, you split the sea. Um, they went through the sea on dry land. And it stops there in our Sidur. In our Sidur, it stops there because it goes then right into uh, uh Azashir, essentially the, the song of the sea. But this this text goes far further, and it's as if it's almost talking about like the milestones of the journey or the the important, the significant um elements of coming out of Egypt. Coming out of Egypt and being led with the cloud by day and the and the fire by night, and then going to Mount Sinai. And then getting the Torah, the laws, and getting the, the water from the rock. I'm just going through it very quickly. So I'm going to go back and just read it and read in, in detail the, the verse that's underlined. Um, so we got out of Egypt, we came through the sea, and then verse 12, amur anan hanchitam yomam. You led them by day a pillar with a pillar of cloud. Uve amur esh laila, and a pillar of fire by night. To light the way that they should walk on. Of course, the lighting of the way refers specifically to the fire. Um, and, and so we got out of Egypt, 
We got the cloud and the fire, and you came to us at Har Sinai. The Al Har Sinai Yaradata, the Daber Imahem Mishamayim. You came down from heaven and spoke to them on Mount Sinai and gave them the Mishpatim, the Torah, Chukim, Mitzvot, right? These commandments, these laws, these teaching. You gave them the laws of Shabbat and other commandments. And you gave them bread from heaven, verse 15, Lechem Misha Mayim, Natata Lahem, and water from the rock, Mayim Misela. So um, what I wanted to show us is that the cloud is part of the whole package here, having to do with God's relationship and God's protection. And then the relationship piece is the, is the mitzvot, but the protection has to do with the splitting of the sea, uh, the water from heaven, the, I'm sorry, the water, the bread from heaven, the water from the rock, and the cloud and the fire. So it's not just, um, it's up there with Sinai <laughs> and it's up there with man. And something I didn't bring us, but it, the, the text as well, um, many the Midrashim talk, uh, con connect the cloud and the man and the water by um, connecting those to Aharon, Moshe, and Miriam. The water came in merit of Miriam, the man came in merit of Moses, and the clouds came in merit of Aharon. So these three being the three pillars, no pun intended, but pillars of protection and, and, and sustenance that the people needed to, to allow their journey. Um, this also, uh, I, oh I, yeah, it wasn't so significant um, and the translation wasn't here, but again, the context of God providing for them. This is a Midrash that talks about um, that God didn't behave with the people um, you know what, it's worth reading because we have time. I, I actually wasn't sure we would get to this, but I'm glad we got to this. I'm going to read it and translate it as we go because I find it very beautiful. So the context of this verse is, is very specific. God took them out of Egypt and didn't bring them through the Plishti, the Philistine um, territory, because that would be scary. But this Midrash plucks that out of context, as Midrashim do, and just end, ends with the word Eretz. So it reads, God did not guide them, Derech Eretz, in the normal way of the world. And what that means is, according to this Midrash, Shalona Hag Imam Kederech Kol Haaretz. God didn't behave toward the people of Israel like the way everyone in the world would behave. What's the normal way of behaving? Someone who acquires servants or slaves, could be avadim, but servants. It's that God acquired B'nai Israel as, as, as God's servants to serve him. Usually someone acquires an Eved, acquires them so that this person will wash them. This sachinoto and anoint them with lotions and basically serve them, right? Malbishinoto, dress them. And toanimoto me really fun of that um, when you acquire a servant, that person is serving you. With God, it was the opposite. Instead of I've acquired a servant and the servant is taking care of me, God did not behave in this manner toward Israel. God didn't behave, again, reiterating the verse, like everyone would behave acquiring servants to a master. Rather, God provided for us. God gave us everything we needed. God washed them. And then there's a verse from Ezekiel about washing in water. God anointed them another verse about anointing with oil. Vehil bishan, and God dressed them. Ken Yechezkel. Unisa'an, God carried them. Uh, now the verse is from Shimon that says, I carried them like on wings of, of eagles. Umeir lifnehem, this is the part that's underlined. God showed them the way, light it, lit the way. Shene'emar, as it is written, and this is our verse, God 
uh, walks before them by day in the pillar of cloud and by night um, in the pillar of fire. So the fact that God provides for us seems to be a sign of God's, I don't know, care, coddling even, um, leaving nothing to worry about. And this is where I think the, to go to the musical, you know, in many ways, the yellow brick road is there, but the Glinda character is the protection. She comes and goes, she shows up just at the right moment. Um, she's the one who, if you remember the scene with the poppies when um, uh, the wicked witch puts a spell over Dorothy and her friends and then it's the, suddenly, suddenly Glinda the, the witch, Glinda the good witch, excuse me, um, makes the snow come and, and, and provides you know, assurance that Dorothy's gonna get to where she needs to go. And it's that protectiveness symbolized by the road, symbolized by the miracles, by the, even the power of the ruby slippers um, that is all having to do with Glinda as this angelic figure or this protective figure um, over Dorothy, making sure that she will get to her destination. Um, God here is, is spoiling us. God is, is making sure we have everything that we need and including clouds beneath our feet and around our bodies and over our heads. So it never was going to be um, a threatening or scary place going through the wilderness, which it otherwise would have been because we knew we were going to get uh, to our promised land. I'm going to pause and start to reflect as a group. I'll remove our spotlight so everyone can see each other. You can click um, gallery view if you want to see everyone. And I'm, I'm seeing some more comments um, in the, uh, in the chat here, the unscrolled Torah is the yellow brick road. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Let's start. Let's start going around the room. Gloria, uh, there's many Glorias here. Okay, Gloria Aronoff wrote the unscrolled Torah yeah. is to you like the yellow brick road. Yes. Do you mean physically, like in that image? In, in the image, but also in also following the Torah, following the yellow brick road will you uh, will reveal wis the wisdom that you need for life. I like that because we also say yeah. uh, the yeah. paths yeah. of Torah, the Torah's path that we call derech, and these are paths of, of yeah. pleasantness. But also for me, visually, I just could see us unscrolling the whole Torah it would equal the yellow brick road. So, Although we would never step on the Torah scroll. God no, we it, would so not. We, there would not be the cloud underneath to protect the Torah. Okay, good. To protect the Torah. Very good. So this is a point where please um, raise your hand to your camera if you want to say something. I see Bunny has something to say and then let me know who else wants to chime in. Go ahead, Bunny. It just occurred to me talking, thinking about the clouds and the fire that how um, environmentally clouds provide moisture during the dryness of the day of the desert. And oh, fire true. provides heat for the coldness of the desert at night. And, I and love that, Bunny. <laughs> Mm. oh yeah yeah that's right <laughs> that's what I was thinking about when I was visualizing the desert that's, and what was going on that's so practical that's eminently practical <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah because the dryness of the day and the cold it's true it's always surprising that a desert gets cold at night but it does thank you bunny anything else um no. I see Naomi also is talking about no. yes protection from the heat of the day yes Hello. Um, who else wants to chime in with some thoughts or some comparisons? What's resonating for you in this? What's the role of the, I mean, if I know that you don't, you don't want to make close comparisons and have everything, oh, this is symbolic. It's not an allegory, but I right. just wondered all these little people, <laughs> the much uh, uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, because, I mean, also, so Barbara, this is, we're playing, right? We're not going to take this. Right, 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 so right. That's okay. We can play with it. Who are the munchkins or what's their role? I mean, what's interesting is that they are, they're not the same as Dorothy, right? They're not, they're not characters that are fully human. I hate to say it that way, but um, it, uh, the truth is, even in, from what I've read in the way that those actors were treated back then in the thirties, um, the, the 
those individuals with dwarfism were 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 not were not treated in the same way that the fully um, that the taller humans were, um, the taller actors. But these they're like I don't know they're like messengers. They're like follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. They're also looking up to her. She's their hero. I don't know. She's freed them from their oppressor of the wicked witch of the east. Um, it's something I actually wanted to look at more next week with, with Ding Dong, the witch is dead, and thinking about freedom from oppression as the way that this narrative really kicks off. So let's, let's hold that here and, and think some more about it. Could I just I saw someone else was trying to say, oh, Annie, go ahead, Annie. Um, in terms of our people leaving Israel, we were adults, yes, we were like children learning a new way of life. So if you want to ah, extend the, uh -huh. since we're playing, we'll extend it to the munchkins <laughs> who were fully formed adults, but yet appear to be like children. You know, and, actually, I like that. And I would, I would extend that metaphor to Dorothy herself. It's sort of a coming of age moment for her. She's played by an adult, but she's supposed to be a little girl in the story. Yeah. And she's, um, she's coming into herself. She starts out, yes, very much the same way that our tradition talks about the fledgling nation this, in its infancy in Egypt. And then- and that's why uh, they complain. They complain and whine <laughs> like little children over and over again. You give your children yeah. what they want. You provide them with everything. And at the, <laughs> least, the least thing that happens, oh, you know, you never do what I want and you never help me. And, and you wondered how did the people forget all the miracles? But the same way yeah. the children, the same way the children don't process the miracles of their existence. Our nation, yeah, I, didn't, nation didn't. I die. love that. I th I think it's very true. It's very true. The and their journey in the wilderness is their adolescence. Um, they don't hit hit maturity really until the end. So they certainly begin as children in Egypt, totally dependent. And the miracles that happen in Egypt are God giving them everything on a silver spoon. I mean, they had it rough, but still. Uh, so yeah, so I, I'm, I'm all for that analogy and I would put it to Dorothy rather than to the munchkins. I don't wanna get too stuck in the munchkins small size, but I think they're, um, I don't know, I have to think some more about their, their role in our, in our metaphor. Um, Max, I see your comments in the chat about um, about the mind of the cloud and the water. I don't know the connections. Yeah, Miriam and the water, certainly she's always with water, right? She's, she's watching baby Moses in the water and she's at the song of the sea with the water. Um, I haven't seen anything explicit. The, the Midrashim that talk about those three actually don't go far into Miriam and the water either. You know, when we when we know that the, the the cup of Miriam at the Seder is already kind of a thing, we we go right to Miriam and water. But um, these commentaries are just kind of a list of these are the three and in merit of these three. So I don't know if they, I don't know. I, I can I can look back at it and see what do they make of Aaron being connected to the cloud? What do they make of Moses being connected to the manna? Um, yeah, thanks, Max. We could, I mean, we could come up with something, I'm sure, but I don't think they do. I'm not convinced that they that they go there, that they think too deeply. And yes, David, I see your comment. That yeah, following the yellow brick road, following the Torah, very much in the vein of what Gloria was saying at the beginning. You know, the Torah path is the is the right way. And I don't know if you've all heard the expression, um, so, someone who who used to be Torah observant and then decided, I'm trying to say this very diplomatically, decided not to be Torah observant anymore. Um, there's an expression in the religious community that says they're off the derech, off the path. We might say they made a different choice for their life and the off the derech is sort of a judgmental way of saying we're on the path, you're off of it. But, um, but it is the, the derech is very significant in terms of the right way to go, the way of life, the way of Torah, the way of mitzvot. So that, that, and that yellow brick road is the, the belief that following the Torah will take us somewhere desirable. 
right? Will take us to uh, something that we'll benefit from. Other thoughts, yes, Bunny. Uh, following the Torah, following the road um, involves a choice uh, to follow. The munchkins have not developed a free choice. Otherwise they would mm -hmm. follow the road too. So there's a differentiation <laughs> right. between what Dorothy represents and what they represent. And I think that that's something that I have to think about, but I, to me, it's- Yes, it's, yes, that's very significant. Well, why is Dorothy going on a journey? She, she has something to get. She has something she needs um, in order to find happiness. These munchkins, yeah, they're an, it's an underdeveloped set of characters, right? They're there just to kind of say, follow the yellow road. <laughs> they're um, uh, <laughs> almost the way the chorus works in any musical, like the, the chorus are there to just facilitate the, the main actor's journey. The munchkins are not on a journey. Dorothy's yeah. on a journey. But, but Go ahead, Barbara. Okay, so couldn't you look at the, the yellow brick road as a metaphor itself uh, that it's not an obviously it's not an act nothing is actual in this thing but that it's that everybody has their own yellow brick road in other words mm. you're not going to get to where you want to go unless you're following some kind of a vision or some kind of an inner certainty or an instinct or an intuition that leads you from one place to another <clears throat> and that you're in movement that it, it's the whole idea of a progression that you don't get from mm. It's not easy to go home when you've been thrown off the path, you know, when you've been uh, disoriented or, or taken out of your natural habitat. Or, or you've and been you get back in a whirlwind, it. right? In that, in that right. And you're not going to get back to it in a whirlwind. The only way back is now it has to come from inside you. Uh, it was an external whirlwind that brought her there. But mm -hmm. getting back mm -hmm. to it, she has to, she has to plan her own route. Um and 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 it's not, it's something that has to come from inside. I don't know. I just well, and I I, I love that. I, I and I think um, this is one of the reasons why the Wizard of Oz is ultimately a, a fantasy or a fairy tale because there is a yellow brick road, and you just put one foot in front of the other, and you know where to go. And and of course, real life isn't that way. Um, but but there is a maturing right at the end. Glinda said, "You could have always gone home. It was on the inside, right? It was just right there on your own two feet." but you had to learn something along the way. So there is a, maybe a bit of more of a depth there. Uh, and, and, and I, I want to get to that also later on about this journey, the journey of going back home, but home is really somewhere right within you. And that, that's what makes this, I think, an enduring narrative. It's, it's a fantasy, but it's also has a, a little more, a little more depth um, than that. Um, I, uh, I want to close by watching one more video and I see there are more comments in the chat. Keep, keep them coming. Um, and I, I, I wanted to watch the version of this from The Wiz with Diana Ross and Michael Jackson singing Ease On Down the Road. We'll talk more about The Wiz and the way they remake this whole narrative. You know, Dorothy is a school teacher. It's a completely different version of telling this story. Um, and remember also, this was a very... This was a movie that became, it was, it was about the music ultimately, right? It was about, um, I'm not even well-versed enough to say, funk, uh, that, that the, the African-American music of that era. Um, it's, it's wonderful. And it was, um, it was very significant, you know, these, these fledgling stars, Diana Ross and Michael Jackson, whatever your opinion of Michael Jackson later in life, um, it's a wonderful uh, rendition of this ease on, ease on down the road. So we're going to close the hour by watching this one. I've so much enjoyed being back together with all of you and we'll look forward to continuing our journey down the yellow brick road next week. Here we go. Did you say yellow brick road? Yes? Look over here! We don't need no caps. <laughs> Say, what's your name? My name is Dorothy. Dorothy and Toto. What intelligent names. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dorothy and Toto, seems like we're gonna have to find our own yellow brick road. <laughs> yeah. 
Ease on down. Ease on. D down the road. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Ease on down. <laughs> Ease on. Down the road. Oh. Oh. Don't you carry nothing that might be a load. There it is. Dorothy, look. Dorothy, look. Oh. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, next week, what we're gonna be doing in general is we'll open the Zoom room about 10 to 15 minutes early. You can uh, join in, you can schmooze amongst yourselves. I won't be starting until really 11 o'clock on the hour, but we'll have the Zoom room open if anyone wants to come early and hang out as if you were walking into the space together and grabbing a cup of tea. Thank you so much. Happy Wednesday. Welcome back. Good to see you.